camera. Welcome everyone to a conversation between student leader Sarah Schulman on the queerness of home. We're super happy to have you here in person and out in cyberspace. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, we are the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. My partner, Donnie Jokum and I are the co-founders. Bureau, for those of you who don't know, we like to say is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the primary service that we provide. <laughs> holding this space for queer books and queer culture. Uh, so thank you for your support. Thank you for everyone who donated online. We do have a suggested donation of $10 and I'll pass around a bag. There's change in there if you need it. Um, but if money is tight and you wanna buy a book, please hold on to your money and buy the book. Uh, and if you don't have money, then sit and enjoy and be a lovely person. <laughs> so I'll pass that around. Um, I'm gonna introduce Stephen and Sarah, and then Stephen's gonna do a short PowerPoint before we get uh, going with the conversation. So Stephen Vitar is an assistant professor of history and director of the public history of initiative, public history initiative at Cornell University. He is the author of The Queerness of Home, Gender, Sexuality, and the Politics of Domesticity After World War II, just out from University of Chicago Press, and curator of the exhibition AIDS at Home, Art and Everyday Activism, which appeared at the Museum of the City of New York in 2017. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, and Time, among other places. Sarah Schulman is a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, nonfiction writer, and AIDS historian. Her 20th book, Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up New York, is a finalist for the Gotham Book Prize. So please give them a warm And let's get this going. Well, I really just want to start by thanking Greg and Donnie for having me here, for organizing this. And, um, I have admired the work of the Bureau for such a long time. It's really such a great pleasure to get to be in this space. And it's still kind of, I don't know, amazing and moving to see a stack of my of books that I now wrote there. So thank you, um, Donnie and Greg, for this event, but also for the work that you, that you do. Um, and I want to thank Sarah so much for just um, one of the... the um, one of the first people I knew I wanted to be in conversation with when the book came out. So I'm so grateful to have you here. And really, I want to thank everybody um, here today. It's such a pleasure to get to be here in person with all of you to talk about this book. The Queerness of Home traces and thinks about how home structures what it means to belong by tracing how queer and trans people have challenged, interrogated, um, and negotiated, negotiated what home looks like. There are so many different ways that home st structures the norms of gender, sexuality, race, and class in everyday life. Um, where well, the book begins in the 1950s at a moment, at a moment when the, when the government and, and mainstream culture are really celebrating and privileging a particularly rigid model of a breadwinner homemaker household is sort of as what it means to belong, what it means to be a citizen in the United States after World War II. And of course, the reality of that never fully matches the rhetoric, but the rhetoric is still incredibly powerful and oppressive, especially for queer people, trans people, and people of color. And so what I'm working to trace in the queerness of home is how LGBTQ people work to remake the home and in remaking the home, remade themselves and remade American politics and culture and how we understand how we understand the work that home does in everyday life and in popular and in culture and politics more largely. The impetus for me really in writing the book was thinking um, about the ways that kind of popular narrative but also academic histories about about LGBTQ politics and culture have always really privileged public space and really tended to elide what was happening 
in more in more private spaces. And especially, I think I've, I was trying to speak to and expand on queer theory, which I think is also really tended to frame home as a space of oppression um, and a space of that a space of constraint, um, especially for LGBTQ people. But the theory that I, that really was meaningful to me in, start, in really starting to think about this project and that I was most building on was really feminist labor history and women of color feminism, because I was interested in the ways that those that those bodies of theory really challenged this kind of caricature of the home as a space of oppression, as, as a space that was apolitical. And so in the book, I'm really trying to expand on those theories and build on those theories to think about how LGBTQ people were beginning from the 1950s into the present to identify home as a space of politics and a space of community formation. Can I move that? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the book moves from the 1940s to 1990s. I just want to say a little bit about the structure of it to give a little bit of a taste of kind of what of the ground it covers. Um, the book begins in the 1950s in the first section, really thinking about the ways that queer and trans people were trying to fit themselves into or integrate into this existing domestic order that really privileged the breadwinner homemaker household. And in that also privileged a particular kind of gender formation. Um, and so the first chapter looks at early, really extra legal gay and lesbian marriages. And the second chapter looking at camp domesticity. Then the second section kind of moves into the 60s and 70s, thinking about the ways that LGBTQ people were beginning to more radically and also publicly try to remake the home. Um, with chapters on, on gay communes, um, they were really were working particularly to try to challenge gender and racial, gender norms is also, and also racism and racial segregation. And then a chapter on lesbian architecture. The final section moves into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and thinking about the ways that queer and trans people began to try to use home and mobilize home to actually address the needs of those most marginalized and oppressed within queer and trans communities with, with a chapter on early, on early shelters for LGBTQ youth, shelters and group homes, and then a chapter on caregiving um, in response to HIV AIDS. And what I'm, in this kind of the sweep of that, the book, part of what I'm trying to show is that queer and trans activists actually increasingly prioritized home and domesticity from the 50s um, into the present, right, over time. And one of the things I also, also know is that as the book moves forward, we also begin to see kind of more um, queer people of color, more trans people kind of taking on central roles, especially as they're beginning to really challenge also um, not just the straightness of home, but also the whiteness of home and the middle classness of home. I think also more largely what I'm trying to show in, in the book across all these chapters is the ways that, that queer and trans people are also really challenging what, what home and family looks like, not just for themselves, but for everyone. As those formations are becoming more public, as the, the groups of people who are impacted by them grow, um, it's, not, it's not just reinventing like, life for themselves, but really reinventing what home can be for everyone. I wanna give also just a little bit more of a, um, just to go into a couple of examples, just to again, give a little bit more texture to this story. Um, so, um, and the ways specifically that queer and trans people are really trying to activate, trying to activate home space as a site of politics. So one of the chapters um, looks at the work of an architect named Phyllis Berkeley, who was a lesbian feminist architect who lived here in New York City um, in the 1970s. And she had this idea to go start going around the country and run workshops with other women, um, asking them to literally draw, as you can see here, their fantasy environments, or what she called women-identified architecture, with the goal of really interrogating and, um, and countering the patriarchal underpinnings of the built environment. And so just one, 
all of the all of these drawings from all the workshops that Brooke B. ran are all now archived at the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College. Um, literally hundreds of them. Um, and so if we zoom into just one of them. Um, here, this is this is one of the drawings called My Block by Joan, or she she subtitled it here, Lavender Lane in the city of sisterly love. And she's basically kind of taken a block of row houses and reinvented it as a kind of communal space, a kind of mixed kind of community space, residential oh, wow. space. Um, and just to point out kind of a couple of things here, you notice kind of in the center, things like a big kitchen and a dining space, um, but also at the bottom middle there, a big party space. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, up on the top right, right underneath the star and the moon, um, it says a soundproof scream room um, <laughs> or a planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep options open, um, very, very important. But I think it's also, um, I think was also like the goal here was to, you know, Berkeley had an instinct, right? That sort of like consciousness raising that if you gave people freedom to fantasize, they might actually fantasize something radically Another chapter looks at Survival House, um, which was one of the earliest group homes for queer and trans homeless youth or unhoused youth, um, founded in San Francisco in the early 1970s. Um, Bruce Pavlov was, uh, was a, actually an undergraduate student in, in architecture um, at, at Cal University of California, Berkeley in the 1970s when he was taking a class on gay space and decided to do a project on Survival House and created this two hour documentary. Um, you can see some clips of here. And um, what's so striking to me about this is seeing the ways that everyone in these, these videos, people who had been previously unhoused, queer people, trans people, um, people who had been pushed out of their family homes or maybe on parole, um, were really transform, working to transform shelter into home. Um, that's the founder um, right there, Effie Mitchell, um, who founded the founded Survival House in 1973. And in the final chapter, I'm looking more closely at caregiving in response to HIV AIDS. Um, this is a photograph um, taken by Susan Copeland, who followed a team of buddies um, from the buddy program by GMHC um, in, the, in 1987. And you can see here um, a woman named Kachin on the left, who was a volunteer, um, and her buddy Michael on the right. And what I have always found so striking about this photograph is First of all, just like the, the physical intimacy between them, right? At a time when there was so much stigma against touching or being near, physically near people living with HIV AIDS, but also, and also the emotional intimacy between, between them. But then also that Michael is wearing a silence equals death t-shirt, um, which is you know, uh, an emblem that we really associate so much with ACT UP. Um, and what I find really striking about that is that I think the photo really challenges us to challenges me to think about the kind of continuity between the kind of street activism and protest that ACT UP was doing and more private activism that was happening in domestic spaces like this one. There were, of course, I think lots of kind of um, less structured and more improvisational systems and everyday systems of care that were happening at the same time. And a lot of the people who were, who were you know, at protests and organizing with ACT UP we're also going home to take care of people. And I feel that there's a way that um, sometimes in prioritizing, again, the history of, of public activism and public space, that we sometimes miss stories like this. And what I also find fascinating with the Buddy Program is, I guess to the larger theme of the book, is the way that also the Buddy Program and other caregiving programs, but really lots of the, of the domestic projects I trace in the book, we're working to challenge what community looked like. Um, in the book, I talk about the buddy program as a form of coalitional intimacy, as I call it, where there's a coalition being formed across racial and gender and class differences. It's happening by being in physical space and proximity to people in, in the kind of way that a program like the buddy program made possible. And that kind of coalitional intimacy begins to really alter the way people are thinking about family and home, but also beginning to also really begins to change how people are thinking about LGBTQ community, right? Who is in that community? And I think more largely, you know, what 
I hope the book shows, right, is that it also, I think, looking at projects like this where, where someone like Kachin is going into Michael's home on a regular basis, that it actually interrogates and challenges our idea of the public-private divide as a strict binary, but actually we begin to see much more overlap and continuity between public life and private life. And that, so that home no longer looks like a space that's simply private, right, but begins to appear more and more as a portal to the public. I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Well, Stephen, first of all, I want to thank you for all the great work you did at the Museum of the City of New York, and especially your AIDS show, and many people here were part of that, and we're all very grateful for that work. Thank you so much. So as a person who learned everything I know about sexism and cruelty at home, <laughs> I approached your book with great cynicism. <laughs> And yet there were things that I really, really enjoyed and there was a great deal that I did not know and I learned from you. And yet I am also still remain cynical in the end. So let's start with what I really loved and was excited by, um, which is the history of gay male collectives and housing collectives. Can you tell us a little bit about that research? Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, uh, the gay male collectives were one of the first chapters I really worked on for the book. And I was fascinated again that this was, seemed like a history that had really been um, under acknowledged. That there was a lot of writing about the gay liberation movement, but when I started to look at that, at that activism, I consistently started to see people talking about the importance of forming co living collectives or communes as a way, not just to right, reshape the family, but to use that also to challenge the norms of, the norms of gender. Um, and also to challenge, and in, in, in many cases also challenge racism, because they're specifically, we're seeing, because this is also coming at a moment when gay liberation was very allied with, with black power movement. And so they saw gay collectives as part of that work. Um, what, and just to say a couple, I mean, one of the things about that to say too, is that queer women and lesbians were also forming collectives at the same time. And in many ways, gay men were really looking to them for, for examples. And what's striking, and so you start to see by the mid-1970s, all of these queer collectives kind of springing up in cities like all over the country and then increasingly in rural areas. What's also kind of challenging is that not all of, they often don't last very long, right? People are writing about, right, writing in newspapers about, um, about like how everybody should be forming a living collective. It's like the best way to live. It's, we need to do it politically. And then four months later, they're like, we've had enough, we're gonna have to live. And that was also challenging to me. And draws out for me, I think, one of the themes of the book, kind of utopian impulse that actually often accompanies a lot of these domestic experiments. Should I too that there were also, um, while, there, while there's certainly a strong separatist instinct among both gay men and lesbians at that time, there also are a number of collectives that were that were both men and women that are and that are more also where it's constant we're kind of consciously working to kind of in gender buff, right? To really challenge that those that gender binary. Um, and also like when you I start to dig at this more, you also realize that there were lots of gay male collectives that were pretty much neighbors to lesbian collectives. And there was even and even though there was this discourse about separatism, there was also a lot more collaboration, I think, than people expect. And do any of them still exist? So a lot of the a lot of the gay male collectives have kind of so a number of them have kind of become radical fairy sanctuaries, right? So it's like Short Mountain, um, like still are here, right? They're, they're, and some people still live there full time, um, but also it's a sanctuary for others. I'd say that more of the more of the lesbian lands still exist. Um, there have been a number of articles recently about kind of renewed interest in lesbian lands. So that's been interesting. That's been interesting to me. Some of them do still exist, and there are also new ones, right? There. That, um, that kind of are, I'm actually looking over um, your shoulder to the reissue of the Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions mm -hmm. written by Larry Mitchell. Um, Mitchell was, um, besides being an amazing writer and a visionary writer, also was a member of a queer commune that he started on Staten Island and then eventually it moved to the Catskills and the map wasn't far enough away <laughs> to Ithaca. <laughs> um, and, you know, Morgan Vasekis, we, we worked to really 
to create a new ish, new edition of, of Faggots and Our Friends, in part, I think, because it's so it kind of holds on to that utopian impulse. Because I think that that move towards collectivity was a refusal and a rejection of the failure of the nuclear family and how it had ostracized and stigmatized its queer members. So I saw that as a very dynamic reaction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, how you feel about that. Well, I think that they, I mean, what I started to see also in the work on the, the collectives was this increasing language about chosen families. Right, we, you know, that, I think language that really took off in the 1980s, but you start to see already um, in, in the writings about, about lesbian and gay communes in, in the 70s. But also I think a lot of the people, I know this more from Lavender Hill, which Larry Mitchell was in, in Ithaca, that people had very tenuous relationships with their families of origin. And they were looking to form a new kind of family. They didn't necessarily cut ties completely with their families of origin, but it clearly was tense and they were looking for something new and looking also for some new kinds of, trying to create new norms. Well, you know, I resist that phrase chosen family because I, it, I think friends are a far more valuable relationship than family. So why would we denigrate our children <laughs> calling them family? That's a great question. And <laughs> it, it's, I think it speaks also to the, I mean, how much of a product of the time these communes were, right? That the, the <coughs> movement to create communes was not just happening in queer, in queer communities, it was happening kind of across the United States and lots of different communities. The, what's, I think what the importance of that is that for, it meant something different for different communities, right? So for queer communities, it really meant challenging gender, it really meant challenging sexual norms. I think that the claim to family and the language of family also speaks to the way that family is held in kind of such high esteem in American culture at large. In some ways, I think you're right that they could have challenged that language. Um, in ways of part of their arguing for its legitimacy and again, the language of chosen family is to use the language of family, right? That it is a family, um, that it is a family as any other, um, it just looks different. Okay, I want to quote you here. Okay, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a lesson plan. <laughs> quote, from the 1950s into the early 1960s, gay male activists grew increasingly prescriptive in recommending marriage as the healthiest form of same-sex relationship and one with the greater potential for advancing the political goals of gay integration and toleration. Lesbian activists, meanwhile, increasingly articulated a feminist critique of marriage as a restrictive social institution. And just expanding that a little bit, I think in that period, or a little bit right after, I think women were more likely to theorize their sexuality as choice mm. and men as biology. Mm. If you all remember the, uh, the big push towards proving the biological origin of homosexuality, this kind of pseudoscience that really dominated around 1980 with the hypothalamus theory and all of that. Um, so does, does domesticity benefit men over women? I think, that, I think that that is one of the undercurrents of the book. And part of the reason that gay men in the 50s are so attracted to this model of marriage right, or of marriage or of a couple that's marriage-like right, is that domesticity has always benefited men more than women. Right? The way that the, the model of um, the breadwinner homemaker household, but even before that, um, a kind of um, male, you know, I think the way to put this, that, that domesticity when it kind of emerges and as an ideology in the 19th century, is women centered but male dominated, right? That women kind of take care of the home, but it's still ultimately men who control it. And so I think that the there's a there is a gender divide in the, in the book but that I think men feel more agency over home than a lot of times that women do, which is why I think also that it's someone like Phyllis Berkeley um, who wants to who sees that they actually need to explode what home looks like, even down to the architecture. Well, a lot of that is because men are always earning more than women, right? So a household of men is always going to be the advantageous income, and a household of women is going to be the opposite. 
but let's bring that to race. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the collective household and the extended family is part of Black life in America. It's not a new concept. And so how do you how do you adjust your view when you're looking at the history of the black of black collective living? I think that one of the one of the, the challenges in looking at the queer and lesbian activism in the 70s around collectives is that they're reckoning with the ways that the, that the gay movement has emerged in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was really dominated by, by white men and white women. And so in this argument kind of to create interracial households, like one of the houses I looked at, one of the households I look at is the Gay Liberation Front House in Washington, DC, which was a really um, kind of self-consciously, self-consciously self anti-racist project. I don't know that, I don't know that in looking at the, in looking at the evidence we have for that, I'm not sure how well they articulated that this was in continuity with, with black forms of family and home that came before. I mean, I think there are still ways in which a lot of a lot of that activism of the '70s is still really filtered by and filtered through kind of the white gay men kind of who are leading a lot of the gay liberation groups. I think that we see in more in kind of lesbian of color activism in in the '80s. Like I'm thinking about a lot of the a lot of the black feminist and black lesbian feminist collectives and projects that emerge and have more consciousness about the ways that work is in continuity with alternative forms of alternative forms of family life, and by alternative forms that, that didn't, never did, and, and maybe didn't want to fit with that model of the breadwinner homemaker household the government was privileging. Well, what's the difference between domesticity and privatization, really? Mm. That's also one of the challenges I really try to take up in, in the book. You know that because privatization, right, where essentially. The language I keep thinking about um, is this language of being on our own, right? Where the way that, of course, is in some ways the. Um, I mean, I just feel like we hear this this phrase echoing a lot now in response to COVID, right? That we're on our own, and in some ways, I think what's a lot of the social service activism that I look at in the book, like the like the, like the shelters and some of the and some of the HIV AIDS activism. Are looking to the government right, to support queer homes. What's striking to me about the shelters, right, is that they they were hoping um, they were they were applying for grants from the city, state, and federal government at a time when the city, state, and federal government were still invested in actually investing in social welfare programs. And so they stopped the, for queer people in the fifties. I think what we see over and over again is a tendency to see the government as a foe that needs to be kept out of the home. But then you get to the 70s, and it's not just that queer activists are making their homes public, but they're actually inviting the government in and asking for support for that work. The piece of privatization, though, I think is, is where that becomes privatization is when, by the 80s, the government starts pulling all of that funding. It doesn't want to fund it anymore. Part of why the buddy program is produced all over the country is because it's needed, right? Because it essentially requires no funding, no funding to support, right? It can be reproduced everywhere. It just depends on volunteerism. You know, that I mean, George um, Bush Sr., right, in sort of his um, Thousand Points of Light speech, so you can see records where he's referring to the buddy program as a model. And so there are some ways that the buddy program kind of served that model of privatization. I think that's the tension of the book. Like, how do you create a home space that you have, you know, that you have agency over. Um, at the same time, thinking about kind of what sort of what kinds of support and rights people need, right, and deserve um, from the societies and governments they live within. Yeah, I want to open it up in a minute, but I just want to bring it to AIDS for a second. You know, in in my in my perspective, the campaign for gay marriage was really the campaign that separated gay from AIDS. Because all those posters of the poster boy couples who've been together for 40 years and therefore deserve marriage, none of those people ever came out as HIV positive. 
And so there was this undercurrent or this implication that gay marriage was monogamous, which we know it's not, and that it was going to be a, cor a corrective to gay male sexual culture, and that gay marriage was going to be the antidote to AIDS. And I think that that's the, the reason that the first national right was gay marriage. You know, it was supposed to be civilizing. That's my understanding. So in, in that way, I see that this promise of gay domesticity, at least in relationship to AIDS, has been very uh, restrictive and had a, a negative outcome uh, of polarization and stigmatization that I'm not necessarily sure has served this community. I don't know what your thoughts are. Well, part of what fascinates me about domesticity in general is the, is the ways that activists are trying to work within the structures of domesticity to remake it. Like, how do you remake a system that I think is by its, um, that's from the start already pretty, is already pretty discriminatory and unequal, but right? marriage already is a, is an un, is a unequalizing force. Um, how do you work within that institution to potentially alter it? And I, I don't know, I think that it's a, it's an ongoing tension. I think I'm thinking about, you know, there've been recent efforts to kind of expand domestic partnership legislation to encompass families that are, include more than two partners. Um, that speaks, I think, to the ways that domestic partnership initially was sort of framed as an alternative to marriage. What we're actually seeing now is a lot of universities and, and cities kind of cutting back on domestic partnership benefits, essentially forcing people into marriage, right, to, to have their relationship legitimated and to get health insurance. I feel like that's an important conversation to be having. Like, I, I think we're, I don't know that we are going to get away um, easily from looking to the government to legitimate to legitimate social forms of family and household. But I, I think that maybe by looking at the legacy of queer homemaking and trans homemaking, we can also begin to see how we can begin to push on it. Well, that reminds me of another thing I wanted to bring okay. up. So let's see, let's open it to you first and then we'll come back. Questions or comments for Stephen? Leslie? Um, on this last piece about the uh, marriage, one of the things that I noticed when I moved from San Francisco with a much more diverse sense of family to Atlanta, where it seemed everyone was very suburban in the gay community and people were really, I felt like there was a different investment in coupledom and homeownership um, in our gay experience. I guess I just, I'm wondering about with this last question about the geographic differences. And um, there's certainly women put in lands in Georgia and throughout the South as well as in conservative states, but it, it seemed that the gay marriage was a real relief for a lot of people. Some women clearly had children who were working class or uh, and non-white, um, at least from the lesbian community, they're non-white women who wanted to bring their family together for the safety of children. So I guess I also wonder where the children fit in, if there are children in the vision of domesticity that is communal, and then it, just that tension between those those kinds of things as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I, I think that the question of children is kind of, is an important one right through this history, especially history, especially once we get into the 70s, because, Queer activists are so interested in reinventing gender, right? And looking, and a lot of people are coming out of straight marriages in the 70s and they can have children. Um, you know, one of the things there's that we see, for example, in a lot of the lesbian lands is this question about what to do with boy children, right? Because they feel like it's supposed to be a women only space. Um, and so what do you do with, with children who are boys, especially as they're getting older? And what a number of them did was send their boys to the male communes that were next door, right? Because, <laughs> with the idea that they were going to help them to, to raise them in an alternative kind of, of maleness, right? Without the kind of the kind of chauvinistic masculinity that they had in, in other culture, but that it needed to it needed to come right through a kind of gender modeling. But I think to your kind of the larger question about how this plays out differently geographically. I think that especially once we get to the, you know, into the last 15 years, there are also these pragmatic constraints that I think the problem is that people are often 
put in the position of trying to find workarounds. I'm thinking especially about cases like second parent adoption, right? And this is a, a faced by both queer couples and also trans couples, right? Where the parent who's not um, biologically related to the child needs to formally adopt a child to have any kind of legal relationship. And I don't know, my hope is a move towards more functional definitions of the family can be, and a more, if we can, if what, a, if what a wedding is, is ultimately just a vow between two people, then can a family ultimately be just a vow between a group of people? Um, why does it need to be legislated by the state at that, at that level? I mean, but that's something I think the tension between figuring out how to create a government structure that actually matches the variety of, of home lives that people actually live. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, great presentation, thank you. I'm curious, I tend to think of collectivism and communism as a kind of a natural human and primate way of, of organizing, and it's radical because of capitalism, because it's pushing back. And I wonder if in your research you come across um, communes or, or queer collectives where they're not sort of pushing back, where they're in a system that is more uh, socialism or, or I mean, where they're really seeing their, themselves as just an alternative. Yeah. I think in general, a lot of the communes see themselves as an alternative. That they talk expressly about kind of creating a model of living for the world that they want. Um, and that's why they're asking other people to just to reproduce it, right? To kind of, so they're writing about it with the hope that other people will follow their model. And they're challenging, not just, you know, not just gender and sexuality and, race, but also challenging capitalism um, with it, kind of expressly. So again, I think that the, the problem that seems to happen is that when they're in the cities, they usually don't last more than about four to six months. Um, most of those gay male communes, some like the ones in DC do last longer, like a year. It's really when people go to the country um, where those communes last a lot longer. I'm thinking of somebody like um, Carl Whitman who wrote in 1969, this, a gay manifesto, which becomes really one of the critical kind of texts of gay liberation. He wrote it while he was in San Francisco. Um, very few people know there's really not a lot of writing about that he went off after writing that to go live in Oregon with his partner and create a living collective and write about it in the magazine RFD, right? And create this kind of alternative structure that was linked right through magazines and through a network of of letters and communication, but really was separate from, really was separate and distinct from gay liberation culture as it was playing out still in cities. Um, I, I have two questions. One is to go back to Sarah's pushback against the chosen family, which I really like that pushback. And I'm wondering if you, either of you wanted to talk about the difference between a collective and just a house of roommates, you know, like if you want to talk about that. And then I want to go back to that, to the line of family, kind of like what do research, what is your research telling you about intergenerational relationships within within queer culture? Thank you for those questions. So I really appreciate the question about what makes a collective different from roommates. Mm -hmm. And I think it basically is what they were calling it, right? And that, and I and it also I think speaks to the power of language as a tool of activism that you know if these are all young people who are in college or just out of college, right? Living with, with making not a lot of money right, and wanting to wanting to live in New York and, and do their political activism. And so collective living also is pragmatic, but calling it collective living or a commune also adds a political dimension that's very empowering. And I, I and I when I say that in some ways it's not very different than living in roommates, I can sound minimizing, um, but I think it actually expose the radicalness of that, right? The radicalness of choosing to live with a group of roommates. I think we sort of maybe grow kind of accustomed to it, but that actually seems like as an alternative to family structure, to traditional family structure actually seems quite radical. Again, I think, you know, calling this, um, calling this a family rather than a, a group of friends, I think speaks to though that they're still seeking a kind of cultural legitimation. They're still working and negotiating a largest ideology about domesticity that they have to that they have to still try to engage engage with. Um, I'm forgetting your second question. Intergenerational. Oh, intergenerational. There, you know what's striking actually about a lot of this work to me is how 
non-intergenerational a lot of it is, right? That part of what's happening in the, in the gay liberation movement and also in lesbian feminism is a tendency to look at an older generation of queer people as being um, kind of sort of conservative or sort of being oppressed in, in, in kind of, and, and, and quote closeted, right? Where the clot, like where pre-1969 culture gets, gets kind of caricatured as being in the closet. And, and then in the closet also means in the home, right? To some degree too, in private. It's though, there are people like Phyllis Berkby who, Phyllis Berkby is a generation older than a lot of the lesbian feminist activists that she's in conversation with. She's born in, in the, she's born in the 1940s. Um, where, uh, where a lot of the lesbian feminist activists are, who are in this, leading the feminists who are writing things like the woman identified women in the 70s are born about 10 to 15 years later than her. And so she's really inspired by their work. She really says in some ways it saved her life. And so I think there are really important intergenerational currents here. But I, I think that it's, an undercurrent more than it's the main current. In some ways there's a rejection kind of of the cohort that came before, even if that's based on a caricature or a misconception. So um, this is a pet peeve of mine that I just wanted to raise. So <laughs> one of the main demands of the women's liberation movement was for childcare, that, that the government, the society should take responsibility and there should be funded childcare. And in fact, that's now even a plank in the Democratic Party. But queer parents, uh, not people who had children in heterosexuality and then became gay, but people in gay relationships who decided to have children, have never as a community come together publicly with a movement demanding childcare. And I'm just wondering why. I'm thinking about, there's a, a wonderful book by Daniel Rivers called Radical Relations about the history of, of gay and lesbian parents. And in thinking about that book, I think part of the reason is that maybe the generation before, um, in, uh, in the 60s and 70s, gay and lesbian parents had to fight so hard just to be able to have a relationship with their children, like legally, and also um, in, in relationships with their, their former spouses, that maybe that, that need for childcare seemed secondary to the need to have- But I'm talking about the next group. Uh -huh. The people who yeah. were gay or in gay relationships and then either use donors or surrogacy or adoption, that com community has never been part of the childcare movement, the, the demand for childcare. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I, I think it's a really important question. It makes me think about the ways that queer theory is and is not in conversation with, with feminist theory and feminist activism. Um, when I talk about like feminist labor his history, I'm also thinking about kind of the, a lot of the work around care and caregiving, which I think that we're beginning to see right through work around trans care, we're beginning to see the kind of expand into the way people are thinking about queer studies and trans studies in relationship to care. But I think that there's maybe been, I don't know, a kind of delay or a, a gap. I think it also speaks to the ways that, maybe this is direct to your point about privatizing, that if you're depending on the government like, to, to recognize your family, there's something potentially really privatizing about that. It could be also about a need to really, to, um, I don't know, sort of to create a sense of collectivity right, around those, those struggles. But I, I think it's also about the ways that, it also speaks to the ways that, um, the things that draw, that sort of tie queer parents together, potentially divide them from other, you know, from other kind of larger questions about care in childhood. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, yes. Uh, again, wonderful presentation. Uh, I was curious, although the beginning of your timeline was the end of the Second World War, I'm curious if you were your research or anything else that you read had become any insight into these kinds of family models of free family or during pre World War II, especially in the, I guess, the, before the Depression, before there was this orchestrated media campaign against homosexuality as a Thank you for that. There, I think there's definitely is evidence, a lot of evidence, right, of queer relationships and queer households before 
before the depression, before World War II. I'm thinking about some of some of the kind of early discussions that George Chauncey reveals about kind of queer domesticity in New York City kind of in the 19 teens and 20s, where especially queer white middle class men are beginning to form households together. Um, he also talks about, you know, also kind of more, I guess, um, unstable homes right in like in um, residential hotels and places like the YMCA where people are creating homes, but not necessarily in an ongoing way. I think that what shifts after World War, after World War II is, again, that the government is prioritizing it more, but there's also an emerging gay rights movement that can speak about it more, that can begin to talk about the importance of, of kind of marriage or marriage-like relationships as a way of integrating queer people into society. So again, it's not that those relationships don't exist before, but their meaning changes after World War II. And, and also because there's an emerging movement that people are able to start to begin to identify with each other and see a community forming around it. But that home isn't just private or separate, but begins to be seen as part of a larger movement in a new way. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you, everyone. And now you can get Stephen to sign your book and okay. talk to him privately. And Thank you to the Bureau for hosting us. Thank you. Don't worry about the chairs. I'll get those, please. So I push them to the side, but I'll fold them up. Yeah. Okay.